Hello everyone and welcome back to Know for GCSE. In this video I'm going to be going over every single exam question in homeostasis and response. Now I spend a lot of time trying to make these lists for you in topic order so that you guys can get the best out of this channel. So make sure you subscribe and share this resource. But let's get started. So let's begin. The way this video is going to work is you're going to have questions on the left hand side and answers on the right hand side. So the first question, compare the structure and mode of action of the two control systems. This is four marks, so give it a go, pause, and let's answer. So the two control systems are the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system, the first mark you would get by saying that these are the electrical impulses transmitted along the neurons. And the second mark is that they are quick and very temporary, they last a short time. The second thing is the endocrine system. So the first mark will be that there's hormones being released and transported in the blood plasma to the target cells. And the second mark is that it is slower and longer effects. The second question, homeostasis maintains optimal conditions. Explain what this statement means for four marks. Oops, sorry. So what this statement means is that enzymes all work in optimal conditions in terms of pH and temperature. And if these conditions are not kept in balance by homeostasis, then the enzymes made will denature and the rates of the reaction will be too slow. So that's what happens and that's what is meant by the statement optimal conditions because we're talking about pH and temperature. So make sure you look at the effects of that. Okay, the next box, the human nervous system. So all of these questions on the human nervous system. Timestamps below for more topics. Joanna eats a toxic sweet and feels tingling in her mouth and her salivary glands release saliva. Describe the pathway of the re reflex action. So pause the video, have a go and let's look at the pathway. So it begins with the stimulus as all of the reflex actions do. So the stimulus is the sour citric acid on the sweet chemical receptor cells on the tongue. So obviously you wouldn't know it's necessarily a sweet chemical receptor, so you would just say the receptor cells on the tongue have detected a stimulus, a change in environment because there is sour citric acid. This then means that the sensory neurons gives an impulse to the relay neuron in the CNS, the relay neuron to the motor neuron, the motor neuron to the effector cells, which carries out the response. And in this case, there is the effector cells are the salivary glands, which produce saliva as a response because the sweet is covered in acid and that could damage the teeth. So that is a reflex action. Now, just generally, the key points that you also need to talk about when looking at reflex questions, it'll be useful to discuss synapses. And these are just the gaps between the nerve cells. And when they ask what a synapses is, it's just where the chemical diffuses across. Okay, the next question is a diagram question. Describe how the structures shown in figure two help to coordinate a reflex action for six marks. So you're gonna be asked to explain what each of these different things are and how does it help to coordinate a reflex action? So this is quite a detailed question. It's not something you would memorize, it's something you would know how to approach. So the receptor is detecting a stimulus, it then generates an impulse, the neurons are conducting this impulse, and neuron A is conducting the impulse, um, and neuron A is specifically the sensory neuron. Then you've got the synapses between the neurons, which is where the chemicals are being transmitted, and it then goes to neuron B and then to neuron C. So the neuron B is a relay neuron, neuron C is the motor neuron, and then the effector here is going to carry out that response. So that's why it's that reflex arc. Okay, moving on to the next question. When ice cold water is drunk, why does the temperature near the brain increase? Now a lot of people got this question wrong, so really do think about it. And let's reveal the answer. So the reason why is because the blood is cooled at the stomach and this cooled blood flows all the way around the brain. The next question is actually the required practical on reaction times. So you just need to bullet point the key things that happen there, the variables, etc. And looking at the mark scheme. Ooh. So 
So person two measured the reaction time of person one. Person one sits on a stool with the good upright posture. Person one places their forearm across the table with the dominant hand on the overhanging edge. The person two holds the ruler vertically. Zero centimeters should be between the person's thumb and first finger. And person two should prepare to catch and drop. Tails two prepare to catch and drops randomly. Person two then records the measurement of person one stopping. Now, an alternative way to do this is instead of looking at the measurement on the ruler, look at the timing, start the stopwatch and then stop the stopwatch. But then obviously that's subject to human error. Whereas if you hold a ruler, the place where you stop is exactly your reaction. And this question give one reason why the student shouldn't move, um, because this was asked, because you would just say movement would release heat and that would affect the reaction. Okay, the next subtopic, the brain. Name and describe the functions of the brain. It's a three marker. So this is quite vague, you don't have to go into specific details. So you've got the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for memory, language, consciousness, etc. Then you've got the medulla, which is responsible for involuntary coordination. For example, the heart rate, the breathing rate, then you've got the cerebellum, which is responsible for voluntary coordination. For example, your muscles moving. When you're lifting something up, that's voluntarily doing that. But when you're breathing, you're not voluntarily breathing, you're doing it subconsciously. Okay, the next question. Describe how scientists study the brain. So you need to look at the three different ways that this can be done and then explain it a little bit. Okay, um, it goes on to the next page a bit, so just bear with me. So three different ways are electrical stimulation, MRI and brain damage. So firstly, pa studying patients which have brain damage, for example, behavioral and psychological effects on those damaged areas and identifying the functions. For example, if you're looking at somebody who has damage in a certain part of their brain, if you look at the effects that it has on them in that specific damage, then you know what that part of the brain was responsible for. Then the second method is electrical stimulation. So stimulating parts of the brain through electricity and um, observing what effects that has on the person. And the, sec the, th the final is MRI, which is kind of the opposite of electrical stimulation, which is when you're looking, you're, you're getting the person to do different activities and then you're looking at what parts of the brain light up. So it stands for magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, the next question. A functional MRI scanner allows a person to move while the scanner makes images of the person's brain activity. Suggest how fMRI scanner could help to find out more about the brain damage. So this is going specifically into the MRI scanning and the mark scheme had this. So it wanted you to give an example so you can ask people to do different tasks, to see which part of the brain is active, to compare with a person without brain damage to see exactly where the damage is. So a traditional MRI scanner cannot be used if people can't stay still. So that the benefit of the fMRI scanner is it allows you to move around so you can see, you can gain greater results because it tells you more. And the final question about the brain, describe how the brain receives information about light entering the eye. So this three marker, what you just have is the cells in the retina, which are, so the retina is this group of receptor cells in your eye. It's sensitive to light and the impulse passes along the sensory neuron and along the optic nerve. And that's how you, and then to the brain. So that's how you receive information. And moving swiftly forward to the eye. So describe how light entering the eye forms images in the brain. So, basically how do we see? So with, with, firstly, it f it's focused by refraction, by the cornea, and then you've got the image that's formed upside down, and the brain then interprets that image the correct way. So all of that just for two marks. So a lot of the detail that you will be, that you need to put depends on the marks. You could put obviously a lot more information about the, the parts of the eye and how it moves, but since it's only two marks, you're not gonna retrieve any benefit from that. The second question, explain myopia and hyperobia. So make sure you know the differences between the two. So myopia is when you are unable to focus on distant 
objects. So this means that your eyeball is too long. That's first mark. So the second mark is that light rays from from a distant from a distant focus in front of the retina. So far away light rays focus in front of the retina and that allows you to raise your focus. Hyperobia is when you are unable to see things that are near to you, near objects. Your eyeball is too short. So the light rays from the near objects actually focus behind the retina. So concave lenses can fix myopia and convex lenses um, can fix the hyperobia. Second question, third question. Explain how the eye changes depending on the light levels. Okay, and this is kind of going to the next question as well. So depending on the light, if it's bright conditions, then you've got the retinal receptor cells, the circ. So what happens is the circular muscles contract and the radial muscles relax, which means the pupil gets smaller, it constricts to limit the amount of light going in your eye. When it's dark, the circular muscles relax, the radial muscles contract, the pupil dilates, it gets bigger so you can see. And I've also revealed the answer to the next question, explain how a person's eye could adjust to form a clearer image of an object. So the ciliary muscles contract, the suspensory ligaments loosen, so the lens thickens and is more convergent than the light rays and allows the image to focus. So notice the difference between how far an object is and the light of an object changes the muscles intact. So if we're talking about the light levels, you need to focus on the circular muscles and the radial muscles. And if you're looking at how far an object is, you're going to look at the ciliary muscles or the suspensory ligaments. And the final question about eye, describe how spectacle lenses can, cre can correct hyperobia. So again, talking about those convex lenses. So it allows light rays to refract more on the inwards, because remember, what did we say about hyperobia? It's when you cannot focus on near objects because it's forming behind, the image is forming behind the retina. So it allows you to move the image more inwards, which allows the focus to be on the retina. This next question is about control of body temperature. So describe why the skin goes red when warm. So let's look at this. Um, so it seems like quite a large answer, but you don't need to put all of these points to get the full two marks. So you've got the receptors, which are happening in, in the hypothalamus, the temperature part of the brain, and the blood vessels near the skin's surface dilate, allowing more blood to flow. And the reason why is they have more blood flowing is so that the thermal energy can be transferred from the skin to the surroundings, effectively cooling yourself because you want heat to go out of your body, to dissipate. And because the blood vessels go near the skin surface, you've got that vasodilation happening here. Okay, the next question. Endocrine system and control of blood glucose concentration. So explain how the blood glucose levels change after having a high glucose meal. So looking at this answer here, what happens is you've got your pancreas, which produces insulin. Remember insulin and glucose. And this causes the glucose to move from the blood to the cells in the liver and the muscle cells. And that causes it to then break down. The next subtopic, maintaining the water nitrogen balance, ADH and kidney failure. So describe how the blood is controlled by ADH hormone. And first thing you want to say that ADH is released by the pituitary gland. So where it is released from and when it is released. So it's released by the pituitary gland when blood is too concentrated. So when there's not enough water, the pituitary gland releases ADH. This then causes more water to be reabsorbed back into the blood by increasing the permeability of the kidney tubules. So it basically makes the cells in the kidney that form the kidney tubules more absorbent of water. And because it's more absorbent, it absorbs more water and less water is used as urine. And it's right, quite important that you mention negative feedback because um, 
that just means when it's a loop, it's like a loop. So if one thing increases, the other thing decreases, and then when that starts to go down, the, the concentration of hormones starts to balance again. The next question, explain how excess amino acids are excreted safely. So in the liver, you've got the amino acids, which are deaminated, keyword here, deaminated, um, because why? Amino acids are, are too toxic, too much of them. So ammonia is formed, but ammonia is also toxic. So ammonia is then converted to urea for safe excretion via the kidneys as urine. So if we're looking at the um, life cycle of proteins, you've got proteins which are broken down into, because proteins are long chains of amino acids, so proteins turn into amino acids. Amino acids are then deaminated into ammonia, and then ammonia is then turned into urea, which is turned into urine. So you can see the life cycle. Finally, the next topic, hormones in human reproduction. So the first question is, how does changes in the uterus lining adapt for fertilization? So, Obviously, you might know that the uterus lining increases its thickness when um, during that part of the cycle. And it does this in order to increase the blood vessels that are providing nutrients for the possible baby for fertilization. Describe how hormones control the menstrual cycle. Now, this is quite a hefty question. And I would say with these long questions, try and remember them diagrammatically. So maybe draw like a little a circle and talk about the different points. But let's help you here. So firstly, you've got FSH. That's the first hormone. It's easy to remember. First is FSH. This is released by the pituitary gland and it stimulates egg maturation. Then you have estrogen produced by the ovary, which inhibits, so it stops FSH production, and it starts or stimulates luteinizing hormone, LH. The LH is released from the pituitary gland as well. So remember, every hormone which has letters like LH, FSH, these are all released from the pituitary gland, ADH. So LHH, LH stimulates ovulation. And then progesterone is released from the ovary, which stops, inhibits FSH and LH. And then both estrogen and progesterone maintain the uterus lining. So those are the key things that you need to mention in your answer. The next question is about contraception. So evaluate the condom and contraceptive implant. So you can see the condom makes is physically physically there. A physical barrier it's readily available and it prevents STIs however it has a weakness as well mate tear the implant is just the slow release of the hormone progesterone in the woman and it inhibits the maturation of eggs so it stops eggs being produced and sometimes in these evaluation questions you need to put your answer especially in this case where it's five marks but there's not much to say so then feel free to put your answer your opinion about it so what is more efficient in this case, it's condom because it prevents both pregnancies and STIs and, yeah, which the implant doesn't do. The next topic and the final topic, plant hormones. So how does auxin make a plant grow towards the light? So explain how auxin works. The six marks. Pause to have a go. So firstly, auxin is obviously present in a plant. The light stimulates auxin to move to the shaded side of the plant where there's no sunlight. The auxin then promotes the cells to elongate and grow on the shaded side, and this then causes the plant to tilt towards the light source. And that's how auxin makes plant grow towards the light. So it concentrates in the shaded side, promotes cell elongation, and then causes it to grow more there. And then you've got a germination practical. So let's look at that. Firstly, identifying the variables. So the independent variable, the thing you're changing, is the light intensity. The dependent variable, the thing you're measuring, is the height. And the control variable, the thing you're keeping the same, is the volume of water. So you're going to place cotton wool in three Petri dishes, soak equal volumes of water, place 10 mustard seeds per dish, leave to germinate in warmth, water daily at the same volume, and once it's been germinated, make sure that the same number of seedlings is there 
You're then going to place it in three different conditions. You've got full sunshine, darkness and partial light. You're then going to measure the height each day over three consecutive days. And you're going to realise that in the darkest conditions, it will be tallest. But you will see that it's not green because there's no chloroplast. So it's going to be yellowish and um, it's going to be shortest in the sunny conditions. And the final question, explain what happens to the growth of the seedling on one side compared to the other side. Um, and what you would just say is the side nearest to the lamp would receive more light and therefore there's going to be an unequal distribution of auxin. And finally, auxin will then cause more growth on the side that's away from the lamp. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it helpful. I'm going to do these videos for chemistry and physics as well as finishing the biology series. Make sure you share this with your friends and see you soon.